Go ahead. Make my day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Ripple Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker, licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please don't hold that against me. Welcome back to it, folks. Got in a, you know, I, I don't know why I like these so much. I, I love all these different outlets that um, put together reports, come up with assessments, and give us some insights into great places to invest for whatever reason. And it's also interesting to sometimes note the differences between them and, of course, the similarities, right? Whenever we see multiple sort of research efforts pointing in the same directions, maybe that means it's time to look that direction. So that's always a good thing. And I like to try to point those out when I, when I catch them. Uh, today's comes to us from Smart Asset. So what we're going to do is run down what they have as their ten the top 10. And this is one where they don't specifically address it in terms of uh, investment or return on investment. Uh, they they kind of focus on cities that are undervalued. Uh, so I thought that would be a great place to start for some folks. It might also introduce some new areas for folks to look into. Maybe you've been listening to the show for a really long time. And I have mentioned all sorts of different communities and none of them have ever been inside your comfort zone, whatever defines your comfort zone, whether it's you're fine with with working with properties out of your area or even out of your state, but you want it to be at least be someplace you're semi familiar with for whatever reason, maybe some of these cities will be on that list because a lot of these are new to the list. I see two or three that ring a bell, uh, but most of them over half, I'd say, are ones we really haven't talked a whole lot in the past. So we're going to cover that. Of course, before we do, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the general findings. I like I like when these guys come with some of the, the general findings that we can then use ourselves in determining what makes a smart move for us. And of course, before we jump, jump into all of that, uh, I'd like to remind everyone the best way to get in contact with me. Of course, that's through the website. You can find that at therebelbroker.com. From there, you can get in contact with me by clicking the contact button in the menu bar. Uh, you can also join the Rebel Underground. There's a couple of interesting things, and I, I realize I should just stop saying this stuff and just start delivering it because it's come up before, and, and sometimes these things don't end up happening. Uh, but I've got a couple of exciting things coming up. I've got an interview with a guest that is not our typical interview, right? We've had some amazing guests. Our, our very first guest way back Um I thought was a stunner, and, and it's one of the ones I love, and one of the, my favorite books uh, that I read over the over the course of uh, of books I've read that people have sent to me. Of course, I'm talking about Francis Greenberger. Um, I really enjoyed that interview. I hope you guys did too. I know I got an awful lot of positive feedback from people who, because uh, I believe we also handed out books uh, relating to that interview. I got I, they were kind enough to give me, I think, five books to, to give away, which we did. Um, so I hope you all uh, can get a chance to go and review that. If you're new to the show and you didn't listen to that one, just go to the website, therebelbroker.com, do a quick search on Francis Greenberger and check it out. I think I also have categorized all interview shows by their own category. So you can go and within the uh, selection process, find just interviews. So feel free to do that because we've had some amazing interviews. Now, Francis Greenberger, there's a guy a lot of people aspire to be, right? Just a billionaire, uh, but he, and he's got this balance in terms of what he likes to achieve. He wants to achieve things in the community and do good things. Um, and then we've got folks who are, are a little bit more mainstream, you know, achieved things that are, I mean, seeing what Francis Greenberger has achieved is, is that's a really high peak. That's like deciding to, to be a hiker and then trying to figure out how you're going to take on the Himalayas, right? So it's, it's a, it's a challenge to get that high. There's other folks who are super successful that are far more within reach that we've interviewed. So feel free to check out those folks too. Um, but in any event, I've, the, the, the reason I even brought this up is I have an interview coming up with someone who's not really specifically in real estate. Uh, I've, the, the, he's a, a pretty, I think he's a pretty well-known YouTube guy. I've been subscribing to him for a long time. And out of the blue last week, he emailed me and said, Hey, how would you like to do a collaboration or a, uh, interview or, or something? So we're going to do that. And we're going to talk about interesting YouTube things to do sort of not as part of that interview, uh, but just stuff that's going on with the economy. 
uh, that I think is more generally applicable, ways to prepare yourself for what's coming. I don't know what his bias is. We'll find out on the show, but I think it's going to be fantastic. And I, and I love the idea of getting people that aren't totally buried in the real estate thing. Now, for those of you who've already managed to listen to a lot of the interviews I've already done and who've listened to me talk for a while, uh, you know that at the end of each interview, I usually turn the conversation toward what do you expect? What do you think is happening? How do you feel about the real estate market? And every once in a while, I'll test the waters by throwing out something we recently talked about that, you know, is an economic fact that pretty tightly dovetails with real estate. And one of the things that always surprises me in the interviews is the vast majority of the time, they don't know what I'm talking about. And that's fine. I get I'm a, I'm a little bit of a data geek, so I'm always out there trying to pull in more information. But it just goes to show you that 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 a lot of folks go out there and manage to do perfectly well without losing sleep over all the annoying news that I put into my head. Um, so, but, it, but it'll be interesting to find someone who has been piling a lot of economic information into his head uh, and see what we can pull out of there in terms of uh, things we want to be mindful of as we move forward with our goals that we can that we can use as ways to alert ourselves to something coming down the pike that we can prepare for, right? Um, so, because here's something else that I found interesting. And a lot of you probably think, well, yeah, you know what, Robert? You're absolutely right. I don't need to worry as much as you do about things that are coming. But I would say no, because what's the other thing that all those folks I interviewed had in common? When the downturn came last time, they were completely unprepared for it, right? They were... Um, destroyed by it in many cases. We, we remember we had one guy who, who told us, I believe he was, he was uh, forced, he, he had been doing fantastic and he got to the point where he lost his house, lost everything. Well, you know, if I had been his realtor and a friend of his at the time, I was actively warning folks. So before it happened, so maybe, maybe if something really bad's going to come again, you can be the guy who's being interviewed in five years by some other poor sucker who's now doing a podcast on real estate and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, you know, during that downturn of 2019 or 2020, I was paying attention to the markets. I was watching what was going on. I was making the connections. I was connecting the dots between human nature, uh, common sense, and data. And I did X, Y, and Z. And while I took a little bit of a hit, because a lot of people did, I was able to minimize that hit. So that's that's one of the goals. I, I The great news is, even if the downturn doesn't happen at a scope that's that bad, by having things in place or plans ready that prepare you for it, you'll still be okay, right? Planning may cost you a little bit of time, but usually it doesn't cost you any money. So you, you wait for things to happen and then you act based on the data you've got. So well, it's just one of the things I like to try and do is help to arm everybody with as much information as possible so you can make smarter decisions. Okay. So what shall we start with here? Let's go with some of the key findings. Uh, the name of the article is uh, The Most Undervalued Cities in America, 2018 edition. It's coming to us from the good folks over at Smart Asset. That is smartasset.com if you would like to check this out for yourself. This is uh, one of those companies where I, you, on a fair, them along with Home Union and a few others are ones I regularly ping for data. Um, so hopefully this will be good stuff for you. Now, what they did here, uh, and one of the things I love is they is they lay out what their methodologies were for these things. And and if you ever have stuff that you where you read a report or research, and you think to yourself, you know, I know that market they're talking about, and it really doesn't jive with what I believe or what I see, what I have observed. Uh, it's always great to then look at the methodology. And if there is no methodology for that report, you might want to not give it as much weight as some other ones. Okay. Let's start with the key findings. First, many cities still offer great bargains. And, and of course, that's absolutely true. And, and not only is it true from the standpoint of cities that have consistently offered good deals, um, it's, it's also truer now because of some of the turnarounds in prices. And that, that reminds me of something else. We're going to do a show. Maybe it'll be Friday's show. Uh, Scott Blasius, our buddy from Sacramento, reached out and sent me along. I believe it, it was an email where someone laid out what's going on in Sacramento. And I don't know if it was their in-house appraiser or their loan guy, but it looked pretty good. So I think we're going to go ahead and have a chat about that and get an update. Uh, from him on what he's seeing in Sacramento. Uh, so, hey, Scott, 
Thanks for sending that in. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about this now. So any cities still offer a great bargain. In total, seven cities from last year's top 10 claimed spots in this year's top 10. So at some point, you have to ask yourself the question, though, if if cities continue to be, quote unquote, great bargains over and over again, does that tend to mean these are just not growth markets, right? You'd, you'd like to think that you're in a market that's going to show growth, but that really depends on your take, right? Are you more interested in a stable market that has healthy rental values or, and so you want to sort of do the long-term thing, or are you someone who wants to get into a growth area so that you can do fix and flips? And, and then that becomes a, a different argument all in itself. So those are things you're going to want to take into account as we go through this list as well. Of the three cities which didn't appear again, two, Overland Park, Kansas, and Fort Collins, Colorado, fell into the top 15. So in terms of being great deals, places you might want to look at that were on the list last year that are not on the list, Overland Park, Kansas, and Fort Collins, Colorado, might just be places you want to look now, right? Why? Because... There, you, it's not that you've missed the boat, but you want to look at why those markets are changing, right? If we're just catching these cities when they're starting to make that upturn, that might reflect a change that you can take advantage of as an investor in those communities. Okay, uh, let's see. They say they were missing data for the third city, Augusta, Georgia, so it was not included in this year's study. Kind of interesting. Why don't you have data for Augusta, Georgia? Uh, did Augusta, Georgia just close their doors for the year. I'm not real sure why. But here's the other thing, one of the takeaways that they have that I think is awesome. It's something that I repeat frequently on this show. And and it's also one of the things that I get into arguments the most most at Starbucks. Um, You know, as you know, I've been super busy. Uh, I kind of deprioritized the show a little bit just because I had so many other things going on. But I still, I'm always out there talking to people and getting into conversations about real estate. And I frequently will bump into real estate folks. And nothing annoys um, real estate agents more than a real estate agent saying it might not be a smart time for you to buy. Uh, You know, uh, it tends to rub them the wrong way. Uh, No matter what time of the year it is, no matter what's going on with the economy, every real estate agent I meet says it's time to buy. Uh, So, you know. You, you kind of have to wade through those waters in order to get, to get anywhere when you're talking to real estate agents. But um, I get into these conversations and we talk about it and I say, you know, do the math, brother. There, there's just no two ways about it. The, your money simply does not work hard for you in California. And then, then they want to bring out, well, look at all the appreciation. Well, yeah, look at all the appreciation and look at all the appreciation people got right up until 2007 and then right up through 2009 and 10 and 11 when that wasn't the case, right? So granted, that could be, if you want to ride that wave, that's fine. Um, but if you're trying to do a buy and hold and where you rent, it's insane. So, and let me give you an example of how absolutely insane it is. So as you know, I tend to keep my hand on the pulse of what's going on with properties. I've also got various areas of San Jose that I consider to be sweet spots, areas that are kind of awesome. And there was a two bedroom, 1000 square feet, basically like an apartment that came up for sale in Santana Row. Santana Row, for those who aren't familiar with San Jose, is the Bay Area's attempt to create a Rodeo Drive, right? Um, They got all the highest end vendors in there and and they're all pre-sold, right? Before a single bit of concrete was poured. They had a plan and then they had signed up all these high-end stores like Rodeo Drive style stores. What's been interesting about that is those high-end stores have tended to be in decline in Santana Row. They've tended to close. There was a high-end watch store that used to be in there that has closed. Uh, There's still a Tommy Bahamas in there. There's still a couple of other high-end places, but I'm noticing that some of those super high vendors are, are not there anymore. So that doesn't speak well to pumping up Santana Row. Santana Row is still super high end, still super amazing, but it's interesting to see them not being able to sustain, to sustain that Rodeo Drive level that they were hoping for. So why am I even mentioning it? I just got hold of a li- no, I didn't get the listing. I was notified of a listing for $1.125 million for a two-bedroom, 1,000-square-foot unit in Santana Row. Um, this is not one of the bigger units. This, this is, you know, a rel- relatively small unit. 
Uh, and I can remember when that was selling less than 10 years ago for like 500 and something, $600,000. But that's, that is a sort of a luxury setup, but it's just a two bedroom, 1000 square foot. And that's what the price is. So prices here are still insane. Um, despite whatever other numbers we talk about, it's, it's absolutely crazy. All right. Uh, so they talk about how California here is overrated and they give an example. For example, our model estimates that San Francisco is one of the best cities to live in with a projected value of $691 per square foot. However, the actual value per square foot there is nearly $972 per square foot. Uh, while our model ranks California cities well in terms of quality of life, the ongoing housing crisis forces the housing costs up. So from their standpoint, from the simple numbers standpoint, uh, they're calling it overrated. And for reasons that I've explained, I consider California overrated, uh, particularly the big areas, the Silicon Valley areas, San Francisco, probably parts of LA fall into that, that mix. But, you know, frankly, I don't know a whole lot about the, the uh, Los Angeles market. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe someone who does know that wants to chime in on how things are going there. All right, so let's go ahead and cover the uh, top undervalued cities here. I, I'm just going to go ahead and run down the list starting at number one. You know, actually, let's go, let's start with number 10 and maybe the last few on the list we'll, we'll look a little bit more closely at. So number 10 on the list is Chicago, Illinois. Um, Chicago is fairly affordable at only $161 per square foot. It's got high walkability, high concentration of dining and entertainment, high percentage of residents uh, that have a bachelor's degree. Uh, their, their model estimates that living in Chicago is worth $290 per square foot. That makes it the third most valuable city in their top 10 list. Um, let's see here. Let me, let me. Then they've got also, you know what else, according to in this list, they've also got the most undervalued cities in America in terms of the top 25. So they give you all the way down to uh, 25, which is occupied by Lincoln, Nebraska. But as I said, number 10 is Chicago, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois. Um, next at number nine is Providence, Rhode Island. Providence, Rhode Island is projected at $285.40 per square foot in value. The actual value is $145.42 with a savings of 139.98. So that's just the difference between the two. Um, we'll, we'll talk in a minute about what forms this projection that they've put together. Number eight on the list is Plano, Texas at $269.67 as the projected value per square foot. $126.83 is the actual value per square foot uh, with a savings of $142.84. Next at number seven is New Haven, Connecticut at $265.04 with $115.08 being the actual value per square foot for a difference of $149.95. Uh, let's see, Charleston, South Carolina comes in at number six with a projected value per square foot of $323 and an actual value of $172.33 for a difference of $150.66. Number five is Ann Arbor, Michigan with $330.09 in projected value per square foot and $179.25 in actual, which gives us a, a savings of $150.84. Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, this is one we have talked about before. Baltimore has actually shown up on a few different lists for us. Uh, it comes in at $241.42 as the projected value. $90.42 is the actual value with a savings of $151. Newark, New Jersey comes in at number three. And I got to tell you, and I, I'm sure folks from New Jersey are going to hate me, but just given the uh, amount of property taxes in New Jersey and given what I've experienced, what I've been in New Jersey, wouldn't be at the top of my list. So, but it's number three on, on in, in terms of undervalued cities. It's projected value per square foot. I don't even know why I say that stuff. All I do is piss people off. Uh, $241.99. The actual is $81.92 for a savings of $160.07. Uh, here's another one, number two on the list. And this one kind of surprises me. It, it, I was actually in Philadelphia a month and a half ago, two months ago for some stuff and poking around, looking at some investment stuff. 26601 
projected. 105.25 is the actual. 160.76 is the savings. And, you know, I tell you, Philadelphia, um, that is the city where they had that weird Starbucks thing where someone came in and that's where the Starbucks bathroom thing kicked off uh, where someone was asked to leave and they called cops and all this kind of stuff. And, and I have had people tell me that, you know, be, that it's, it's the greatest irony in the world that Philly is called the city of brotherly love. Um, you know, and I'll, and I'll be honest, I found it to be perfectly wonderful. I did not, and maybe I was just hanging out in the right places, but I did not encounter anybody. I encountered a couple of people who clearly didn't want to be doing their job. I didn't, I didn't notice it at a rate higher than anywhere else in the country. Uh, but I, you know, I got into some great casual conversations with complete strangers. I didn't, you know, and some of them started by me. Some of them started by other people who heard what I was talking to other people about. So not a single negative experience. In fact, nothing but positive experiences with everybody from the the guy who was the security guard at the front door of a place all the way to the, the guy who made me my coffee or the gal who uh, was, you know, at the gas station, wherever. I had a great time. Now, I was very much downtown, uh, right by the museums right there. Uh, so a lot, looking at a lot of the urban stuff where you would think it would actually be more annoying, right? But not. I, I I would have no problem uh, investing in, in, in Philadelphia. I need to look more at it. And I, I had some folks there that were showing me numbers and, you know, I was helping to direct them and do math on different things. But anyway, then number one on our list, never been here, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, $265.81 is the projected value per square foot with an actual value of $90.67 for a total savings of $175.14. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and if the and some of these were were areas I don't think we've talked about before. I think we've talked about Philly. I think we've talked about Baltimore. I don't think we've talked about Ann Arbor. I think we've talked about Charleston and New Haven. But I don't think we've talked about talked about Plano, Providence, Chicago, Overland Park. Uh, now I'm getting below the ten. So number eleven was Overland Park, Kansas. Number twelve was Chula Vista, California, which is kind of interesting to see. And can and and interesting enough. Uh, Fort Collins and San Diego were both on this list. And they were also on those lists of places where we saw changes in in uh, inventory, right? In the in the right direction. Uh, El Paso, Texas, is in the top twenty five. Uh, Oxnard, California, is number seventeen. That's surprising. My grandfather used to live in Oxnard. Uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Never heard good things about Allentown, Pennsylvania. I've I've met several people who once lived there and. They don't because they didn't want to anymore. Uh, 19 is Midland, Texas. 20 is Bridgeport, Connecticut. Now, before we jump into uh, discussing this uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, let's take a quick break. And after that, we'll talk about the, the data and methodology that they use so that we can see how much this kind of fits in with things we care about as investors. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, The Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com. Robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525. California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Welcome back, everyone. We have been reviewing the Smart Asset Research Report that is uh, telling us what they think are the most undervalued uh, cities in the United States. And we're looking at that r- right from the perspective of uh, investors primarily. But, you know, other, another thing and, and calls I get uh, are interesting. I actually had a guy call me uh, the other day who just wants to be a buyer, but he wants to be a buyer with an eye towards potentially uh, having it to become an investment property in the future. So we talked a lot about duplexes and quads and those kinds of things. But 
these kinds, particularly if you're someone who works in a field or has a job where you can really pick where you live, um, which is a great way to go. I've had, and now of course I see a, a weird version of that, right? Cause I realize most of the people across the country are not software developers, but I get an awful lot of software developers that I talk to that own here and want to sell and move somewhere else. Uh, because they've they've finagled a gig where they no longer need to show up to the office, or they only need to show up to the office once a month. Um, so now they want to do and work, wanted to do what they do their own thing, work remotely, save themselves a ton of money, and live in the house of their dreams for a quarter of what it would cost to live here in California. Um, so it's one of those things where this list plays into those folks, right? They want something that, that – and again, Boise is is one of those top choices for those folks. But anyway, as promised, before we took the break uh, of covering the list, which we covered all of them, the top 10, plus we then read quickly down the top 25, uh, is to talk about the data and methodology, which is always an important thing to consider. Um, in order to find – according to the article, in order to find the most undervalued cities in America, they created a model to project home values – Based on quality of life metrics, I think these are always interesting because oftentimes in terms of our assessments of good investment opportunities, some of the things they look at may not matter a whole lot. To construct this model, they collected data on nine metrics for 200 of the largest cities in the country. Specifically, they collected data on the following metrics. First, home value per square foot. Now, that's data that they got from Zillow uh, from the year 2017. Violent crime rate per 100,000 residents uh, was the second thing. High school graduation rate was the next. Number of extreme temperature days was the next bit of data. Average number of precipitation days per year. Walkability, this is a measure of how walkable a city is. And you know what's funny is I have never, ever had a client uh, want to do a search based on walkability. Now, I've had clients say they want to live in a certain area, and I suppose we could draw conclusions on walkability there. But I find that to be a very rarely stressed element. Now, should we stress that as investors? Well, you know what? It, it's probably not a bad idea because as investors, we want to put, make our product, our housing product, if we're renting, or even selling, more sexy than the competition. So if we can say you're walking distance to the local grocery store and to this museum or to this park or to this hiking trail or this bike trail or this dog park, right? Those are all wonderful things. And that's walkability. That's what that number equals. Um, so it, I don't. I think what happens is people are subconsciously drawn to walkability. I don't think a lot of people grok what walkability is in terms of, of how we tend to define it. Uh, but I think that the things it indicates are good. So while some, some investors I know really don't pay attention to that, if they're calculating it from the standpoint of being able to walk to amenities that the people will enjoy, I, I think it's something that can absolutely pay off for you. Next on the list is percent of population with a bachelor's degree or higher. Next is unemployment rate. And next is concentration of dining and entertainment establishments. So I think all of those things adequately feed into a why I would want to live here vibe, right? So if you're scoring high on these things and that's how they're ultimately calculating this projected value per square foot, right? I think that's a good way to try to hone in on communities that are likely to become more valuable, more desirable, uh, more in demand as we move forward. Now, of course, you're wanting to get ground truth with all of these as well once you've, once you've done through the initial analysis phase, which is something we uh, put a video out for those folks who joined the Rebel Underground. We did a video on uh, assessing a larger metro area on how to focus into a smaller metro area. And I promise, I know I've been saying this forever and and it's still, it's still sitting there waiting for me to finish it. A video on the nitty gritty, how to actually analyze a specific property. And that's going to be coming out um, as soon as I get it done. It'll be done when it's done. I guess I'm not going to promise any dates anymore, but uh, because it's been so long, but it it is coming. Uh, But the bottom line is it's also something you can do now. It's not like you can't do it because I haven't put out a video about it. Uh, Just get yourself to the point where you focus in on those things and start uh, using the same numbers we've always talked about. And of course, another great place to do this analysis is if you become a member of biggerpockets.com. I am a member of biggerpockets.com. I get no money from biggerpockets.com to promote their site, but uh, they are a great source of information. They're a great place to network uh, in terms of talking to other folks who are who are in your shoes in terms of wanting to grow their market. And they're in, in terms of 
the highest ratio of actual investors, I'd say it's probably one of the best places on the internet. Um, you're going to find places that always have sort of folks who talk a big game, like they're actually doing it, but who don't actually do it. They, they'd like to just kind of go up there and, and do the self promotion thing for whatever reason or feel good. I'm not sure why they do it. Uh, but, but you'll find far more verified, honest to God folks who are out there doing it on, on bigger pockets than just about any other place I've ever been. Um, so yeah, use that for what it's worth, but they've also got great tools on there that you can use to analyze property. So I think those are great ways to go. All right, folks. Uh, I hope that's been valuable information here. I think we can we can categorize this data as useful, uh, given what it's measuring, given how they've decided on uh, what makes these places undervalued. I, I think they're reasonable. Some very large observations to make. Almost there's only one community west of the Mississippi on this list. It is predominantly the north, and it's predominantly the east. There's Texas. And there's South Carolina, and that's as far south as we get. And then the next closest place to the south is Baltimore, Maryland. So it's very interesting to see these undervalued communities kind of clustered all over in that part of the country. Um, I can't help but think that we're we're missing some areas on that list. I I can think of quite a few a few places further west. So if you're someone who's in that eastern side side of the country. You've got a lot of things to choose from uh, in terms of communities that you might want to take a closer look at. All right, we've pretty much run out of time for today's show. I do appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I have to say on these subjects. I truly hope that they are uh, worth your time, that we've left more value on the table in terms of useful information than you've invested in time listening to the show. Let me know what you think about this. Are there cities on this list that you think absolutely are not undervalued, that they, they are simply homes that will never reach values higher than where they currently are? And would you like a follow-up to this show? Would you like me to pick one of the top five cities on this list and get into a nitty gritty analysis of it? You know, I've, I've from folks who are all about making really popular podcasts. I've been, I've been told I need to make things more sexy, less numbers driven, less nitty gritty. Um, not sure that's true. Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of get into that stuff, but let me know. I, I'd love to get feedback from the audience on that. The best way to support me or, or well, to support me and to provide me with the information I need to make the best show for you is to reach out and you can do that at the website, uh, therebelbroker.com and send along your comments. Let me know what you think. Do Would you love me to do, let's see, let's pull a city out. I wouldn't want to do Newark. If, if we wanted to do say Baltimore or Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, would you like me to do a little bit more up close and personal of that? Take a look at what properties are there. Try to do an assessment of what the places are renting for. Could you do a positive cash flow deal? Would you like that? Let me know. Again, therebelbroker.com is the place to do it. Thanks again for listening, everybody. I will talk to you all next time.